Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. When former war correspondent Stefan Alex set off for a retreat in the Amazon rainforest, he never imagined that he was about to face the unthinkable. During meditation, he had a vivid, waking vision of a Second World War soldier being hit in the throat and dying on a snowy battlefield. The details revealed in that vision, which included the soldier's name and other scenes from his earlier life, were extremely puzzling. Why did Stefan feel so intimately connected with this person? Obsessed with this compelling vision, Stefan Alex launched into a meticulous investigation and was amazed to discover that the soldier had really existed and thus began an astounding adventure into the past and beyond Stefan's present life. Stefan Alex joins us today to share some of the remarkable synchronicities, experiences and discoveries chronicled in his latest book, When I Was Someone Else, the incredible true story of a past life connection, which has been held by Dr. Stanislav Groff as a remarkable and important book that can change our view of reality. Stefan Alex, welcome. Hello, nice to, to hear you, Sandy. Good to have you here, Stefan. Now, you're a former war correspondent, journalist, founder of the Institute for Research on Extraordinary Experiences, creative director and moderator for a French documentary TV series called Extraordinary Reports. And in your book, When I Was Someone Else, you wrote that as a young man, you found violence deeply abhorrent and yet you were fascinated in the sense that you really felt a compulsion to understand what caused people to become violent. Now before we start delving into why that piece of information is so important which we'll discover later tell us a little bit about what took you at such a young age to Afghanistan to become a war correspondent and then what inspired your interest in the paranormal? Um, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I know it today, partly, but uh, at the time when I was 19, I, I just wanted to become war correspondent. It was a kind of uh, um, obvious um, uh, objective of mine, and, and I really wanted to, to, to do everything that I could to, to, to know a, a war and a battlefield. So at the time, it was in 1988, uh, it was still the, the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan. I mean, the Soviets were still occupying the, the country. And the Mujahideen group, the, the Mujahideen who were fighting the, the Russian invader, uh, were um, welcoming journalists and, um, and French doctor to help them. So I, I get some information on how to do that uh, from French journalists who, who accept to talk to me. And I bought a plane ticket to Pakistan, and I landed in Islamabad. Then I drove to Peshawar, the the border of Afghanistan, and there I I, I tried to find a contact with a Mujahideen group who accept to to take me inside. I was very young, uh, but they didn't doubt uh, I was a journalist, uh, even though I was not officially a journalist. I didn't have any press card. I didn't went to to any journalist school. I was just. Um, coming out of the blue, and uh, but they trust me, and uh, they took me inside Afghanistan for months, and this trip was really one of the most important trip of my life, because I learned so many things about my work as a journalist, what we should write about, what is the reality, how we, how we, how, yeah, how, how we describe a, a, a battlefield, how we describe a situation like that, which is so far away from the, the usual situation we may face in, in France or in Europe. Um, so I, I really learned from, from the ground 
and I spend weeks and weeks and weeks with Mujahideen. I learn Farsi, which is the, the, the Afghan um, um, version, and uh, I, I start talking with the, with the fighter, and they told me about their life, about Islam, about jihad, and uh, I learn, I learn, I learn from the field what those men were going through, and uh, my first article uh, was about that. And uh, from this moment, I, I became so, so passionate with this work of, as a journalist. Uh, my, my fascination about war was not that um, I wanted to fight myself. Uh, I, 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 I was always very clear about that. I was not fascinated by violence, as a soldier, I, I never wanted to be in the in the, in the army or or whatever. I, I wanted to to witness that. I wanted to to bring back information from those places, uh, from front line. I wanted to understand. I wanted to be in this energy and in this uh, uh, kind of frontier. And um, at the time, I really didn't know why. Uh, I mean, it, it became clear long time after and through the story we're going to talk about uh, mostly. And then what brings me to paranormal, I mean, again, it was an accident because uh, from 88 to the year 2001, I was a journalist. I was specialized on drug trafficking, on the East, um, terrorist uh, movement. I became specialized in Central Asia. So I, I published a book about Central Asia and drug trafficking. I mean, I was very, very rational and uh, mainstream journalists specialize on war and Central Asian um, geopolitics. But then in uh, April 2001, I was in, in Afghanistan uh, with my brother and I was uh, heading a mission uh, to do a, a documentary on the archaeological site of Afghanistan. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, there is a huge uh, Buddhist site in Afghanistan where there were two giant statues of, of uh, Buddha and there is also many other uh, archaeological priceless sites in Afghanistan. And um, on the summer of 2000, uh, I decided to, to, to organize a huge mission to go on those different sites because they were in danger because of the war in between Taliban and, and the opposition. And uh, due to my great knowledge of that country, I, I was able to, to go very, I mean, quite easily to many of those sites, but which the, the information I didn't know at the time, it was on the meantime, I was organizing this mission in, U, in France, uh, getting the money and the finance. On the meantime, the Taliban movement and some hard line on the Taliban movement decided to blow up the big giant statue of Bamiyan. Um, I didn't know, nobody knew at the time, but when I arrived in Afghanistan, few weeks after, they, they, they announced the, the decision of uh, blowing those two Buddhist uh, statues. So it was, uh, it was a very, very tense moment for me. It was very complicated. I mean, I mean the world, were, the, the entire world was uh, totally amazed by this, this so insane decision. And I was in Kabul at the time, and I drove to Bamiyan to try to visit the place, and, and I was... Uh, 10 miles away from the Buddha, the, the, at the moment they blow it up. Um, I remember still hearing the, the, the explosion. Um, and after this, this situation, I decided to stay in Afghanistan because uh, uh, it was very, very hard at this time to, for the journalists to work there. And uh, I, I compared to, to journalists who were coming from outside, being based in Afghanistan was very easiest for me to work and to go everywhere I wanted. So I decided to stay there. And a couple of weeks after the, the Buddha blowing, um, while we were driving south of Kabul to visit another uh, archaeological site, one of my car uh, had an accident. And inside the car, there were two French and two Afghan, and all the four died. And one of the French was my brother. So this accident really changed my life. I mean, when you lose a brother, when you lose someone so close, I mean, you, you cannot be uh, not affected by it. And uh, mm. what happened with me is that this, this, this accident, uh, not immediately, but in the, in the following weeks and months, uh, bring back to my mind all those uh, uh, existential questions we may have when you are a teenager. You know, 
we, we wonder, oh, what do we do on Earth? What is the meaning of life? And as we are getting older and, and as we are trying to work and to be efficient in this world, I mean, we forget those questions because we don't have time to address those questions. But when I was, after the death of my brother, I was 32, and suddenly those questions came back to me. And, and uh, for the abuse reason, uh, I was, uh, um, for this abuse reason, I was, I was kind of obliged to, to, to explore it. What do we do on earth? What is the meaning of life if it can stop like that so abruptly in, in a, one second? What's the meaning of the life of my brother who, who lived 30 years? Um, is there a life after death? I mean, does, does this question, could, be, could, could we explore this question in a very rational way, in a scientific way? Or does science know already that there is nothing? Is it, is it something that is, has been proven? So I start doing my job. I mean, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know to do anything else than journalism, which means asking questions and doing investigation. So I start investigation this question. What do we know about death? And um, I, I interview um, clinician, researcher, doctors, uh, consciousness specialists, and, and very, very quickly, I realized that the assumption we are living on in this materialistic world in Europe and in, in the West, uh, saying that a brain is creating consciousness, and then when brain is dying and when brain is dead, there is no more consciousness. This is a belief. This is not a scientific proof and true. True, sorry. This is a belief, and this is a belief that is not being proven. So the opposite could be true also. The opposite, which means. Uh, the consciousness doesn't have anything to do with the function of the brain is a possibility. So um, this fact really uh, blew my mind because <laughs> I, I was not expecting that uh, uh, we were living in a so irrational world. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I realized that it was worse to investigate those questions rationally. And it's what I'm doing since uh, 20 years now. Yeah, for you. Uh, presented, you created and presented a documentary TV series, as I mentioned earlier. But then at one point in your life, you decided to take a trip to Peru and something else happened <laughs> to move your um, consciousness along in a, um, a very unexpected way. Tell us about that trip mm. and that experience. Yeah, this trip was important for me because, you know, after working on death and, and life, uh, after realizing very quickly, I mean, in a few months of investigation, I realized that uh, there is a relationship in between brain and consciousness, but it's not a causal relationship. It, it, it's, it's not that the brain is creating consciousness. So today, and, and at this time when I leave for Peru, I do believe that we are um, partly spiritual beings. Part of us uh, doesn't belong to matter. Part of us go beyond space and time. So life is not what's happening between the, the day of your born and the day of your death. Life is much beyond that. So there is a meaning of going through this terrestrial life. And you find this meaning when you sometimes uh, allow yourself to do a step back to to, 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 to put you aside of this daily life, which is totally overwhelming usually. So for me, the discovering of a shamanic uh, tradition was a great, great opportunity for me to, to explore my, my inner life, to explore my soul, to try to find uh, a way to, um, yeah, to, to go beyond my daily life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I learned also something very important from my working on death is that sometimes in our life, we have an intuition we should do something. But very quickly after that, we said, oh, I will see that later on because there is another priority today. But I learned that to postpone important things uh, to later it's a possibility and, and a risk to postpone it to too late. I don't know if it's very clear the, the way I'm expressing it, 
No, but, uh, it is clear. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, so in my life and for many years now, when I have an intuition that I should do something very important, I follow it. Mm. Even though it, it obliged me to, to, to stop everything I build, to stop a career, to stop a, a, a very um, stable uh, job. I mean, and at this time when I left for uh, this retreat, it was a couple of years ago, uh, as you said, I had a lot of activity in France. I directed TV series and I wrote books and everything. So it was, um, it was very great, but I was also kind of exhausted. And I was also kind of, of trapped in my, in my life that was asking me so much. So I decided to quit everything and to fly to Peru uh, to do a shamanic retreat. And for me, it was a matter of life and death at this moment because I was exhausted. And um, so basically in this retreat, I start doing nothing. And really, if you can believe me, after working for years and years and years nonstop, suddenly being alone without any phone call, without any email, without computer, with nothing to do except just trying to listen to you and to see what's inside, it's one of the great presents you can offer yourself, um, mm -hmm. no matter where you are going. It's not necessary to go all over the world in Peru. You can just uh, offer that for you in, in 10 miles from your house, in a, in a monastery or anywhere. A place where you can just stop the, the, the daily life and the automatization of the daily life. So I was there in the forest, and um, I remember on the plane... I was writing on my diary, I would like to meet myself. I would like to see who I am deep inside of me. Because we know, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 percent of ourselves. But there is this deep part that we call unconscious. And we don't really know what it means, unconscious. It's, it's things that belong to us, that, that we are made of, but we don't know what it is. We don't know where it's come from. Does this unconscious is coming from or, or a biography, biographical life? Or does it come from or karma? Does it come from elsewhere? I mean, we don't know. We, we know for sure that things, uh, um, we, we have things that, that drive us. We don't know where they're coming from. So my intention was to, to go there and to be... Uh, uh, lonely enough to start to do a physical practice, meditation practice and shamanic practice to try to uh, bring light to the shadow inside me. Uh, but I was absolutely not expected what, uh, expecting what, what did happen. I was not expecting to find a, a memory of a past life so clearly like that. I was, I was seeing the, this retreat more than, more like a, yeah, a psychological retreat, um, um, and, and a little bit more than one week after uh, I arrived there, uh, suddenly in the middle of the, of the day, I, I decided to do a little shamanic journey without any substance, because uh, as probably some of the audience know, in, in Peru and in Amazonian shamanism, they use ayahuasca, yes. which is a psycho, uh, psychedelic brew. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I did practice ayahuasca session uh, time to time, but on this trip, I didn't want it to, 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 to drink ayahuasca because I wanted to, to go more smoothly in my inner experience. So I was only drinking um, a brew made of a master plant. What the shaman call a master plant, it's a, it's a plant that has a spiritual property and uh, during the, the process of drinking this plant, which is not psychoactive, you, you may be influenced by the spirit of the plant who helps you to, to teach you, to inspire you, to give you answer to your question. And those, quest those answers may come through dreams, through intuition. Through, it's, it's a very subtle process. Uh, but I insist it's not psychoactive plant. So I, mm. it's like if I was drinking a brew made of roses or a such a plant. Yes. So I, I drink the plant and I ask the plant, I ask the spirit of the plant, please help me to, 
to know me. And I lay down on my bed. I put the ear set on my on my ear with the a, a track of a drum session, uh, which makes doom 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 doom. It, it helps the brain waves to dissociate, and it helps to to do a shamanic trick more easily. And I close my eyes, and then, uh, as you said, I I start having a vision, which was totally unexpected because. The beginning of a shamanic journey, you, you know you, your imagination is active. You know that it's your brain who is creating the landscape you start uh, seeing. But this time, suddenly, very quickly, the landscape, the situation, the vision I had was totally different than what I would have expected. It was, uh, I mean, coming really out of the blue. I was in the rainforest of the Amazonian uh, Peru, and suddenly I had a vision of a landscape, snowy landscape, uh, somewhere in a very cold place with German soldiers, with this German SS man just in front of me, staring at me. I knew his name. I knew his rank in the SS. He was Obersturmführer. I had all this information coming just like like memory. I mean, uh, I, I didn't know at the time if it was a memory or whatever. I didn't know what it was, but... Uh, uh, to, to make clear to, to, to your audience, it's, it's like if you remember something, uh, you remember the name of your father, then you know the name, it's in your head. Uh, and this time it was really like if I was remembering all what I was seeing, the name of this guy is rank. And I had this very clear and vivid vision of him receiving a shrapnel in the throat and being killed this way. Um, it was intense. It was unexpected. It was very, very surprising and overwhelming. And it lasted um, 30 minutes, which was the, the length of the, the track on my, on my, uh, on my um, recorder. Um, and when it stopped, I mean, my first, my first thought was that, oh, my mind make up such a powerful scenario, um, <laughs> like my mind would have created a dream maybe for my unconscious to express something about my fascination of war or of violence or whatever. I mean, I, I, I did not expect at all it could be something real. So when I came back in France after a couple of weeks, um, since I'm still curious and journalist, I Googled the name I had in this vision. And I was not very surprised to find that one uh, one name appear in a list of uh, what looked like SS a list of SS soldier officer officer, um, but for me it was a coincidence. Like if I ask you now to to imagine a name with a German um, sound, you, you may have a name coming up in your mind, and probably we could find this name in a real list of a real uh, officer. It's it could be surprising, it could be uh, yeah, everything you want, but it, for me, it, it would be a coincidence. So for more than one year after my return from Peru, uh, I didn't consider this else, uh, I mean, being something else than just a coincidence. But for, for some reason, I don't remember why, I mean, I don't recall, I, I start to, to do again research and I start again to to Google the name of this uh, Alexander Hermann, Oberschunführer. And uh, I went a little bit further and it drove me to, to contact a French historian who was specialized uh, on World War II. And when I, I mean, this, this historian knew my work in France, so he, he knew me, he knew I was a, a serious journalist and, uh, and he took seriously the, 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 the experience I was telling him. And uh, his first advice was to, to ask me if I uh, do, did some research on the archive, the German archive, which I, I haven't done. So I contacted the archive and I realized that there was a, a, a file available, a military file uh, made of 78, nearly 80 page uh, from this Alexander Hermann Obersturmführer. So I, I asked to receive it. And after a couple of days, I received those those uh, page. It was a copy from microfi mi microfilm, 
And uh, I, I don't speak German, so it was a little bit complicated for me to try to figure out what it was about. But I, I also forward the, this file to the historian. And very late that night, um, the, the night I received the file, he, he, he sent me back an email with the, the major information he had taken out from this file. And one of the information was really for me, again, uh, a totally mind-blowing information. Uh, in the file, it is said that this, the real Alexander Hermann, Oberstundführer in the SS, was killed by a shrapnel in the neck. And it's written black on white. We have his death certificate in the file. I, I, I immediately check out and it was real. So, Stefan, I, I, I need, I'm going to hold you there because this, this is a great cliffhanger and a good place for us to go to break. Um, and everybody will be dying to hear more by the time we come back. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and my guest today is former war correspondent investigative journalist, founder of the Institute for Research on Extraordinary Experiences and author Stefan Alex. And we're talking about his latest book, When I Was Someone Else, The Incredible True Story of Past Life Connection. We'll be back with more remarkable evidence of Stefan's research into his past life connection with that dying German soldier. The future of Internet radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. Mental health. Most people think it means mental illness. Most people are wrong. Mental health doesn't apply to just some of us. It applies to everyone. We're all susceptible to anxiety and depression. They're human conditions. And no person should ever feel embarrassed, ashamed, or be discriminated against for being human. Cracked the Podcast strips away the shame, fear, and stigma by expanding the conversation into areas less often visited. From brain and body chemistry, hormones, food, nutrition, trauma, and the microbiome, to pharmaceutical drugs, psychedelic substances, meditation, visionary experiences, and spiritual awakenings. Cracked, the podcast will explore them all, including the notion that, for many, breakdown can be the beginning of breakthrough. For in the words of singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen, there is a crack in everything. It's where the light gets in. Cracked the podcast, slaying the dragons of mental health. Join co-hosts Sandy Sedgbeer and Rebecca Shaper on the first and third Thursday of every month at 12 noon Eastern Time. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back, Stefan Alex. Sorry to interrupt you there, but I thought it would be great to give our audience the same experience that you must have had when you received that email. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, I remember that day um, for many reasons, but also because it was the birthday of my brother who died in Afghanistan. Um, so, from a synchronicity point of view, it was kind of um, mm. bizarre. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, 
So I, I, I remember very, it was very late at night. I was still in my, on my computer and I, I received this unexpected email from this historian because I thought it would take him a couple of days to read all the file. And uh, it was a very, very brief uh, note. He said, this Alexander Amann was born uh, there in this city in Germany and he, he joined the SS at this this date and uh, he was in this division and blah, blah, blah. And, and he died in Russia on October 20, 1941, uh, killed by a shrapnel on the neck. And I was, I mean, it was a so shocking sentence for me because it's exactly what I saw one year before. It's exactly what I saw. This vision of this man receiving a, a shrapnel on the neck was so vivid, so in my mind. I mean, still now when I'm talking to you, I, I still see it. I still see his face, his look, his, his, his eyes staring at me and receiving the shrapnel on the neck. And suddenly the blow, uh, the, 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 the blood uh, blow out his neck and he falls on the ground and, and he's dying in front of my eyes. And I am just observing the scene from outside and suddenly I am also inside of him, like if I was inside his body uh, being killed myself. I mean, it was so emotional that uh, reading that a real man uh, by the real same name of Alexander Amman was killed the same way I saw it. I mean, suddenly it was not anymore possible that it could be a coincidence. It was not any more possible. It was, a, I mean, something not important. It was a, a, one of the moment more important of my life. And I, I, I must uh, understand what kind of link I may have with this guy. I, I must understand. I mean, I must dedicate 100% of my time to investigate this story. And it's what I did. It's what I did because uh, um, it was also so uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, it's not, it's not like... Uh, if I had a vision of a Buddhist hermit in the Himalayan cave or something like that, I had a vision of a German soldiers, uh, SS soldiers. I mean, those guys were believing it when it, in what they were doing. They were the, 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 the active uh, 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 um, follower of Adolf Hitler. It, it yeah. was uh, the, the worst guy you may find on earth. So what the hell? I have a link with this man. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the, yeah. but I, I was I was I was uncomfortable. I was I was very disturbed. I was uh, full of question, and I really wanted to understand. Now the research that you undertook was absolutely meticulous, and you had synchronicities all along the way, and there were other people in that vision that you later on also found out were existed. Yeah, I saw uh, beside of the, the vision of Alexander being killed, which came uh, four or five times during the, the entire experience. I had also a vision of uh, Alexander in a civilian clothes with another man, um, another man which were uh, very close from him. Uh, I don't know if he was a, a friend, a lover, or a, a relative. I didn't know. I didn't have any information about that, but I only knew they were very close. And there was also this little girl, a little blonde girl, maybe four or three, uh, two or three years old. Uh, there was no woman. Uh, there was only this little girl. So uh, uh, after starting realizing this real Alexander uh, exists, I start to, 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 to do my job to, to investigate what information I may know about uh, uh, where he served, wh what he did. Uh, uh, I had a lot of detail in the military file uh, explaining where he went. Uh, he was in France. Uh, he, he was part of the of the military uh, unit to invade France in uh, 1914, uh, 1939. Sorry, uh, 40. What I'm saying. Um, he, he went to to different place also in in Europe, and um, and. It was hard to find out if he, he, he had a daughter. Um, it was not very clear. Sometimes a young girl was mentioned in the military file uh, because it mentioned many, many things from his life. But I, I was not very sure. And with the historian, we investigated that. And we were not very sure that there was a, 
a daughter of him. Uh, we knew that he, he get married. I find out the name of his wife and where they get married and where his wife were uh, were living. So I also try to see if his wife uh, were still uh, alive because uh, she was something like 20 in, in 1940. So she could still be alive, maybe 90 years old or 85. Uh, so I was full of hope, full of, full of expectation. And it was uh, a little bit hard because I don't speak a word of German. And uh, for some reason, German and French are very, very different. So, um, and, and for some reason, I mean, it's, it's kind of easy for me to do an investigation on drug trafficking in Uzbekistan or in Kyrgyzstan. But uh, to, to start doing an investigation in Germany to try to find a journalist there who helps me were, was more difficult. So it was a, kind of bizarre. But I decided to one day to, to just take my car and to drive to, to, to East. To, to, to drive to different places where uh, Alexander were, uh, uh, was, was stationed uh, or live. And, uh, and it's what I'm telling in, in, in the book. I, I wanted to visit all the places uh, mm-hmm. where I could find some trace of him. And as you said, um, this, this investigation I'm telling in the book is, um, is strange because... Um, it's, it's both a very rational investigation, like an investigation that could be made by a, an historian or a journalist, but it's also a very intimate and very subtle investigation inside, inside me, because um, this Alexander is, is part of me uh, in some way. I, I am who I am today. I don't have anything to do with, uh, with this guy, with this thought, with his life, with what he did. Uh, I'm the total opposite of his, uh, his um, of who is he uh, uh, regarding... It's been very, I, very conflicting for you because here you are conducting this investigation into this man who's working, you know, uh, <laughs> for a force that nobody um, thought, you know, was a benevolent force. And at the same time, you must have had such kind of distaste for that and yet alongside it this compulsion to find out why why was he like this yeah it was it was um it was very complicated to tell the truth and even though my wife was was worried at the time because suddenly alexander was taking all all the place in my house in my mind in my life and and my wife was was worried to see how how weak and how how, how sad I, I was. But in the meantime, I knew deeply inside of me, and, and my wife knew also, that it's going through the shadow of yourself uh, that helps you to find the light. I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just an intellectual sentence for me. It's, it's real. And it, it's what I'm trying to practice in my life since many, 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 many years. Um, it's not when you avoid what it's difficult that it's, that makes your life better. Um, it could be better for a very short time, but it became worse and worse if you don't address and if you don't face the real shadow inside of you. And uh, um, no matter how difficult it was uh, during those months of investigation, I knew that I could find... Uh, more than just an answer, I could find um, uh, a relief if if I was uh, strong enough to 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 keep this this investigation till the end. Yeah, the book. I mean, it is just the most gripping detective story on one level. I mean, there are so many elements to this book, um, you know, and all of them are just mind blowing. Um, we don't have enough time, and I don't actually want you to tell the whole story because I want people to go and read the book for themselves. It is such a great experience. But I do want to ask you some questions about how how that experience impacted you overall. I mean, you did end up meeting Alexander's daughter, didn't you? So, sorry, I didn't hear you. you. You ended up meeting Alexander's family. Uh, I'm not sure if it was his daughter or his granddaughter, but you met oh, his family. 
it would be it would be too bad to 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 answer this question for the reader <laughs> because uh, yeah we won't point tell point them to... how but you know you did there's so many I pieces find of evidence job. yeah I find so many pieces job. of evidence yeah, yeah absolutely so what after you had completed this journey what did you make of the experience i mean you must have wondered why has it happened and why now? What was the purpose of it? Um, there must have been so many questions in your mind. Yeah. Yes, of course, it, it, it was for me kind of curious because uh, I study a uh, reincarnation case uh, through my work as a journalist. And I did interview uh, uh, Jim Tucker, for instance, who, who is the the head office of uh, the Division of Perceptual Studies that have been created by Jan Stevenson in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a place uh, from the University, Medical University of Virginia who study uh, memory of past life. Um, and it appears that the, 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 the person who may have a lot of memory are young children. Usually young children may have um, a lot of detailed memory from previous life uh, especially when the previous life were uh, ending in a very violent way. Mm -hmm. And this memory uh, on children kind of disappear uh, at the age of five, six, seven. And, and then when you are an uh, adult, you just have, don't have any more memory. So why uh, those memory come to me when I was more than 45? Um, I, I don't have the answer for that. I have an intuition. And the intuition is that uh, as I said before, we are made of um, not only our biographical life. We are made of uh, maybe our ancestor uh, or um, all our family trees uh, have a kind of influence on us today in the present time. Maybe, you know, um, a great, great uncle who have died in a very difficult way, who, who was not able to solve his problem at the time, maybe the, the psychological problem of this great, great uncle is in some way inside you today, and it, it belongs to you maybe to help him. I don't know if I'm making it very clear. And, and yes. I, also, I think that those memory from our ancestor uh, participate in our life today, but also probably the memory of our past life, or many, many past life. So... Um, I think sometimes we believe we we are the only one who decide what we do on our life. We believe we are on or, or on, on on we are driving our life. But I observe that we are not very free in in, in reality. Sometimes the the great decision in our life it's like someone else in us is taking the decision. It's not right. us. Sometimes we meet someone, we take a job or we take a decision that um, we don't know why. And it's like if it has been inspired by some part of us, we don't know. And I think the meaning of life is to try to work as much as we can on decreasing the confusion of our mind. The more you can bring light inside your shadow, inside your unconscious, the, the, the less you will be confused to choose what you want to do to, to live. I mean, to live, basically. So um, something happened very, very strong uh, for me when I was visiting the Dachau concentration uh, camp north of Munich, uh, where Alexander was stationed for a couple of weeks. I wanted to visit the place, but it was the first time in my life that I would visit a concentration, concentration camp, and I was very, um, uh, I was very concerned about this because. Um, uh, so I, I drove there, and I, I remember I parked my car in the parking, and I start walking toward the entrance of the camp. Uh, it was a huge place, and the place that could be visited. Though there were a, a lot of uh, visitors. And, and I was walking, and I, as I was walking toward the entrance, the more I was uncomfortable and, and very ashamed. I was, I was kind of having inside of me this, this guilt and this shame and this sadness. And I walked 
toward the entrance and then I pass the entrance and I suddenly enter the huge field of the camp himself where the prisoner were. And suddenly I explode. Suddenly I start shouting. I mean, not shouting too loudly because I didn't want it to be, um, to be disturbing for other people. But I was kind of lonely in, because the place was so huge. And I start crying. And at this moment, I start talking to Alexander. And at this moment, in this minute, when I was in the camp, I realized, I mean, it was more than uh, intellectual realization. It was more a physical realization. I realized that all this guilt, all this violence inside of me, all this sadness was not me. It was of him. It was my kind of... Uh, legacy in some way, but it was not me. I didn't kill anyone. I was not a bad guy. I am a good person. And this bad guy I was holding in me for reason I ignore, uh, it, it was not me. I don't know if I'm very clear, but suddenly in those minutes in Dachau, uh, I, I observe inside of me a kind of dissociation in between me and him. Yes. Before that, him and me, we're, we were mixed inside of me, and it was confused. It was it was hard to dissociate who was my thought, who was his thought, yes. who was his emotion, who was my emotion. And from that moment, his emotion, his guilt, his uh, his uh, the, the bad person inside of me um, went out. So it, it didn't solve all the problem of my life in in one second like that. But from that moment, um, I. I understood it was possible to really, really um, have a more clear life and have a more clear view of who I am and what I'm made of. Uh, and I think um, we all have this opportunity in our life. I mean, I was fortunate to, to find out this uh, very, those precise detail uh, to, to, to allow me to do this investigation but I heard so many testimony of people doing a therapy, for instance, or a hypnosis or a, some other technique that helps you to calm down the mind and to open up the unconscious. And during such a therapy, you may have a memory of uh, something that doesn't seem to belong to you. It's an invitation. It's an invitation for you to get rid of those bad memories, to get rid of those influence that probably make your life complicated sometimes. Um, we all have this opportunity in our life. So really what I want to um, tell in my book, it's to, to say to every reader that um, we can always get better. We can always find a light, no matter how difficult is life. Uh, probably even it's the purpose of life to be difficult because it helps us to, yes. to, to heal so, and to cure yeah. ourselves. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in the book that you felt like someone or something was helping you in your search. Do you think that someone or something was Alexander or your intuition or some third party or a bit of each? Uh, you know, Sandy, I don't know if it's really important to answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> you don't then don't answer it <laughs> i think i mean yeah i mean i i'm a journalist so i'd like to answer those questions and i want and i'm really looking forward to it but uh, on the meantime what's important is to observe that when we ask for help we are not alone yeah so i i could interpret that sometimes when i was in germany or sometimes when i was in russia and I was asking for help. Maybe it's the Alexander spirit who helps me. Maybe it's a guardian angel. Maybe it's my inner self. Uh, I, I may have my own answer, but what's important to, to keep in mind, I think, is that we are never, never alone. I mean, we are not um, forgotten beings on a very uh, uh, bad planet. We are spiritual beings doing an experience here with our body, and we are not alone. There are around us spiritual beings who are still spiritual, who 
I mean, which we cannot see, which we cannot hear in our daily life, but they are here around us and they love us and they help us going through this experience. I'm really convinced of that, not because I learn it uh, on church uh, or in, in an ashram in India or whatever, uh, just because I saw it on my on yeah. my life in many time in my life when I was uh, during this investigation I'm telling in the book, but also during my my life as a war correspondent when I was sometimes, I mean, I, I was in a situation where I was about to die and suddenly something happened that was totally crazy and I was not dead and, and the problem was solved. Uh, or sometimes I was uh, uh, kind of blocked and, 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 and stuck in a situation and suddenly something happened that makes everything clear. Uh, and I think we, we, we should pay more attention to this in our life. And we should also, it's, it's something that I learned, we should ask for help. You know, I think we have around us a lot of, let's call them guardian angel. I don't know if it, it is, but let's call them like that. I think we have around us a lot of guardian angel who get bored because we don't ask them to help. Yeah. Uh, please what? consider we have, we have those persons around us and they can help. Um, we, we may find each of us the, the way uh, to do it. Maybe it's a, a way when you go to sleep just before getting asleep in your bed, you just ask uh, anyone who is around, anyone who can help me, please help me in this situation because I'm very confused about this job. I don't know if I need to take it or not. Please help me and maybe uh, pay attention to the dreams. Maybe there is one dream on the very early morning that will have a kind of sort of answer. This is the first way, but there are plenty. And I think one of the way I, I try to use, and it's not easy, uh, but I try my best to, to use it every day, is to trust. I trust life. And I trust that no matter uh, what's happened in the world, um, there is a... Um, it's a good opportunity for me to, to learn. And to trust life doesn't mean you will be uh, taken away from uh, uh, bad things. Uh, but it's not b because bad things happen that you are not helped. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I may get a little bit confused, but it's, it's hard for me to be clear in English. That's uh, okay. You, we, we understand you. We understand thank you. you very much. We are almost out of time, Stefan. I want to know, I mean, you have... Um, started your institute, you've had your TV programs, you've written books about this. What are you doing now? How has this informed the work that you're doing now? Um, I'm, I'm, if I want to synthesize the idea, uh, I know that I have a soul, soul inside of me. I know that what I'm looking in the mirror every morning, what it's called Stefan Alex, it's just not totally me. It's uh, just the face I saw, I see every day. So I'm trying every day to work in a spiritual way to reconnect with my soul and to find a way for my soul to express itself more easily and more, uh, of, more, um, uh, more often than, than, than usual. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, 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 to be a spiritual person in, in this world. Um, yes and I'm to write about it. Yeah. And do you have another book that you're writing now? Oh, yes. I just uh, finished uh, my, my last book, who will very soon coming, uh, will, will, will be published very soon, in a couple of weeks now. And what is that about? Uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's about a psychedelic uh, therapy, basically. Ah. And... Um, the, the, the exploration that is uh, uh, able with uh, psychotherapy using psychedelic. Great. Love that one. Um, oh, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time, Stefan. Where can people contact you or find out more about you? Uh, I have a web um, uh, a Facebook page, official uh, Stefan Leek's official, where I publish a lot of things uh, about my, my inspiration, the books I'm reading, the books I'm writing, so I'm trying to, to, to share a lot of things uh, on a daily basis on this page. And uh, 
But you know, I, I, I take a lot of time to write, and for me, books are the, the best way to share uh, a very deep inner experience. So I was fortunate to have two of my books published in, in English and available in, in, in English language. Uh, and the last one, When I Was Someone Else, is probably the most important book I ever read, wrote. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about the idea of some of your listeners today will be curious to open this book and to, to discover my work and my journey. Well, that's my hope too, because it truly is a fabulous book. When I Was Someone Else, The Incredible True Story of Past Life connection published by inner traditions and you should also check out stefan's book the test incredible proof of the afterlife stefan alex thank you for joining us today thank you very much Cindy. thank you very much thank you um that's it for today uh facebook.com forward slash stefan alex a double l i x official i'm sandy sedgbeer I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me.